Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With a day of so many learnings, we have reached the final session of PyCon Sri Lanka 2022. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Russell Keith Maggi. Dr. Russell is the founder of the Beware Project, developing GUI tools and libraries to support the development of Python software on desktop and mobile platforms. He is also a 13-year veteran of the Django Co. team and for five years was president of the Django Software Foundation. In his day job, he wrangles data pipelines for Upwave. He's a frequent speaker at Python and Django conferences around the globe, sharing his experiences as an open source developer, community maintainer, and a startup founder. So today he is here to share the gist of the discussions of the day on what was, what is, and what will Python be in the future. Hope that would complete your learnings for today with a sneak peek at the future of Python. The stage is yours, Dr. Russell. Thank you very much. And I'll just get the slide deck up here. And there we go. All right. Is that all working? No, oh, no, that's not. Yes, it is. There we go. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Ayo Bavan. Uh, I am Russell Keith McGee. I come from and I am speaking to you today from Wajuk Noongar Budja, otherwise known as Perth, Western Australia. Uh, if you've heard my name before, as the introduction said, it may be because of my contributions to Django. Uh, I joined the Django core team in 2006. Uh, I'm not active in that community anymore, but I was an active uh, contributor to Django from 2006 to 2015. And I was president of the Django Software Foundation from 2010 to 2015. Django still has a very fond place in my heart, but it's not where I spend most of my open source time these days. These days, I have a collection of projects that I manage under the umbrella of the Beware project. Beware is aiming to do to native applications what Django did for websites, to provide the tools to make it easy to produce native applications in Python uh, for your laptop, your phone, your tablet, and more. Beware is still very much a work in progress, but it does have practical users. For example, this slide deck is being presented using Podium, which is a presentation tool written entirely in Python using the Beware suite. A big part of the challenge of Beware as a project is actually getting Python to run at all on some platforms. Beware isn't just for your laptop or your server. It targets mobile devices, iOS and Android, and we have in the past supported the web as a native platform. And the work that I've done on porting Python to various platforms has broadened my opinion about what makes Python, Python. Now, if you've, you've all just spent a day at a PyCon hearing from dozens of speakers about the many different ways you can use Python and the problems you can solve with Python. So based upon everything that you've heard today and seen today and everything that's brought you to this conference, I'd like to ask you a question. What is a Python? Well, it's a programming language, right? Oh, right, awesome. We're done. We can go home, talk over. Except that's not a complete answer. And today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the properties of Python and the Python ecosystem, properties that might make you reconsider what Python actually is and how it can be used. More importantly, I'm going to discuss why that would matter to you as someone trying to get things done on modern computing devices. So at the highest level, uh, Python, the language, is an abstract thing. It's a specification of syntax and semantics that describes how to make a particular sequence of human readable bytes uh, to be interpreted by a computer to do something interesting. Python, the language specification, is not that useful by itself. It's a book on a shelf. To be useful, we need an implementation of that specification. And so Python is also an implementation of that language specification. But having said that, when you tell someone to go to the Python website and download the installer, you're not strictly talking about Python. You're talking about CPython, which is the de facto reference implementation of the Python language standard. This separation between implementation and specification is valuable because it means that CPython isn't the only way that Python can be interpreted. There are features of Python, as experienced by end users, that are features of CPython, not the language itself. 
the GIL, for example, the Global Interpreter Lock, which is the perpetual bane of Python performance discussions, is not an inherent feature or misfeature of Python. It is a feature of CPython, a specific reference implementation of the Python language specification. CPython, because of the way it's implemented, has a GIL. But there are other implementations of the Python language specification, and some of them don't have a GIL. By separating the language specification from the language implementation, we're able to have something that is a Python, but doesn't have the same operational characteristics as the C Python reference implementation. For example, Jython is an implementation of Python that runs on a Java virtual machine. Iron Python runs on the Microsoft.NET common language runtime. PyPy is a just-in-time compiled version of Python that doesn't use C at all. MicroPython is a version of Python optimized for running on embedded devices. None of these are downloadable directly from python.org. If you go looking, you might find some references in documentation or wiki pages, but they're not advertised prominently on python.org. But they're still Python. They run Python code just as well as C Python does. There are some restrictions on compatibility of binary modules, but the Python parts run exactly the same. So Python isn't just the C Python that you download from python.org. It's any implementation of the Python language specification. But even then, once you've got a Python implementation, there's lots of pieces. Wherever you got your Python from, there are some common elements. So let's pull apart what you get when you get a Python. A full Python implementation like CPython consists of a parser, which takes human input and turns it into an in-memory representation of code. There's a compiler, which takes that in-memory representation and turns it into something that can be executed. There's an eval loop, which can read and run the output of the compiler. This is what you experience as the Python executable. And there's the standard library, which is used by the code running through the eval loop. But do you actually need to have all these things and still have a Python? What happens if you remove them? If you think about the user experience for most programs you use on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't need a parser and a compiler. The developer ships you a version of the code that is pre-compiled. The developer needs a parser and a compiler, but all you need is the ability to run the code. And so if we can ship a runnable version of the code, we don't need to ship a parser and a compiler. And CPython has a runnable representation. It's called bytecode. And that's what you find in uh, PYC files. Bytecode is a bit like high-level assembly code. It's a binary encoded set of instructions for a stack-based virtual machine. It has basic primitives like pushing and popping values onto a stack, uh, setting attributes on an object, mathematical operations, and so on. Bytecode is the runtime format that's used by the CPython interpreter. CPython compiles to bytecode internally, produces PYC files as an optimization. But there's nothing to say we couldn't create an independent implementation of the CPython virtual machine capable of running CPython bytecode. In fact, you can even implement that bytecode machine in Python. A few years ago, Ned Batchelder uh, wrote a, a project called, or developed a project called ByteRun. ByteRun is a full Python bytecode machine written in 1600 lines of Python. Alison Kapta then did a, a really great write-up of that code in the book, The Architecture of Open Source. If you want to learn how Python works internally, this is an amazing resource and it's all freely available online. I highly recommend reading the chapter on, on Python as an interpreter, but the rest of the book is awesome as well. A Python bytecode machine written in Python is a bit of an academic eccentricity, but it is a completely viable way to run Python, and non-academic projects have attempted to do the same thing. Batavia was an experiment of the Beware project implemented in JavaScript. Python VM Rust is a separate project written, as the name suggests, in Rust. They both provide implementations of the C Python virtual machine, the thing that actually runs Python PYC files. So are these Pythons? They run Python code, they just can't compile it. Does that matter? I'd argue that as long as there is a development tool chain that can get Python source code to run, then you've got a Python, which means that Python is, or, uh, Python is a bytecode machine. But then which bytecode machine? I've already mentioned Jython. It doesn't use C Python bytecode. It uses Java bytecode. Does that make it any less of a Python? What about other bytecode machines? Are there other bytecode machines that might be interesting targets? Well, there's one virtual machine in particular that looms large over modern computing, the JavaScript virtual machine. Batavia implemented the CPython virtual machine in JavaScript specifically so that you could run CPython bytecode in the browser. But 
can we target the JavaScript virtual machine directly? Well, yes, we can. And there's a couple of approaches. The first option is to write JavaScript, but use a different syntax and compile to JavaScript as a pre-compilation step. And that's what a project like Transcript does. Transcript is a transpiler. It takes Python input and outputs the equivalent JavaScript. What you ship to the browser is machine-written JavaScript that has the same semantics as the input Python code. That generated code can be messy because JavaScript and Python have different rules for variable scoping, and there are some language features that don't map well between languages. But it does work. But it's also probably not the most interesting approach. The more interesting approach skips JavaScript as a language altogether. One of the side effects of having multiple competing browser vendors is that over the years, they have competed with each other to make the fastest JavaScript interpreter. Thousands of person hours have been put into making JavaScript run fast. And a lot of that effort was put into just-in-time compilation, or jitting. Jitting is a technique that identifies pieces of code that run fast while they're in the interpreter and turns them directly into machine code at runtime. A few years back, a team at Mozilla looked at the JavaScript language as a whole and worked out the subset of the language that jitted efficiently. And in theory, if you only use that subset of JavaScript, your end code will run really fast, almost as close as native code on the same machine. They called this subject, subset ASMJS. Why? Because it's effectively assembly level JavaScript. It's a set of very low level primitives for dealing with integers and floating point arithmetic, uh, defining function definitions, function pointers. And if you write your JavaScript code using this subset, you can effectively write cross-platform machine code because it's ex executed by your browser as JavaScript and then jitted to almost exactly the same machine code that would run. What is delivered by ASMJS is still JavaScript code, though, in text format. It's utterly illegible JavaScript code, but it needs to be transmitted in text format like JavaScript and then parsed, interpreted, and jitted in the client browser. But because it's an assembly language, you can produce a compiler that will convert any code in any compiled language into ASMJS output. And that's what Enscripten is, a compiler that will take C code or any other uh, C, uh, Clang supported, GCC supported language and convert it into an ASMJS payload. This means that any project in C can now be deployed into a web browser, including things like Quake. The process of doing this is a little inefficient, though. We're producing JavaScript source code that tricks the JavaScript interpreter to JIT the way that we want it to. If we know ahead of time that our code will be compatible with this fast JavaScript subset, we can shortcut the parser and the compiler and send it to the browser in a ready-to-use format. That format is WebAssembly. WebAssembly, or WASM, is a binary format that formalizes the ASMJS JavaScript language subset, but delivers it to the browser in a format that is pre-parsed and pre-jitted. That makes it smaller and faster, even though fundamentally it's the same code that's going to be executed. So we now have a way to convert any C code into a binary form that will run in a browser. But the C Python interpreter is written in C, and if we can use Inscription to compile any C, can we compile CPython into WASM? Well, yes, we can. And as of a couple of weeks ago, CPython supports WASM as an output target. You can now ship a full CPython interpreter that will run in your browser. When you do this, you are running CPython bytecode compiled to the JavaScript virtual machine. Thinking about Python as a bytecode machine rather than a language specification means we can now start to run Python in places where it couldn't previously run, like the browser. And that's great, but it also changes what you might think about as the Python developer experience. I'm guessing when most of you learned Python, you were introduced to the Python shell or a Jupyter notebook. And in that environment, you write your Python code one line at a time and you see the compiler's response immediately. If you've been using Python for a little while, you've probably been exposed to the idea that you can collect a bunch of code into a single py file and you can run that .py file from the command line. That's not as immediately interactive, but you're still working directly with a Python code and a keyboard. For many people, that is the Python experience. It's a highly interactive experience and there's the success of Python in education and science shows. It's a very powerful and compelling experience. So is this specific developer experience Python? Some people argue that interactive and interactivity is a key and inseparable part of the Python experience, but I'm not so sure that it is. 
those of you who have done web programming with Python should already be protesting because that isn't your experience with Python. You deploy your code to a web server. That experience isn't ever interactive. An author writes code and deploys it, but the end user viewing the website never sees that code. Instagram is a Python site written in Django, but as an end user, you don't care. There's nowhere on the Instagram app or Instagram.com where you can type in Python code. That doesn't make it any less of a Python, though. It just means the end user interactivity isn't a feature of the Python experience. The code is still likely being treated the same as code run from a command line, though. What is shipped to the web server is Python source code that is parsed and compiled and then invoked when the user makes a request on the web server. But that's more of an accident of Python's history. Python's historical experience is that you run the Python interpreter over source code and that the end user will have both the source code and a full parser and compiler. But think about every other program on your computer. You don't know or care what language they're written in. What language is Microsoft Word written in? Unless you work at Microsoft on Word, who cares? There's no interactive component, so the language it's written in is irrelevant. So if you're developing an app to deploy to an end user, do you need to preserve the interactive component to still say you're using Python? The web experience certainly suggests you don't. So can we go a step further and remove the parsing and compilation from our runtime environment and still have a Python? Can we just ship the bytecode machine and have Python? Another question related to this, why is typing white space sensitive pseudo English text the only way you can work with Python? As long as you can produce something that generates bytecode that a Python runtime can execute, is it still a Python? And that's what projects like BlockPy ask. BlockPy and many other projects that are so very similar are block programming languages. You drag and drop blocks into a graphical environment. In the case of BlockPy, it actually maps one-to-one -one with actual Python code, but you could write directly to C Python bytecode without exposing Python source code at all. Is this a Python? If not, what would you need to add to make it a Python? And if yes, what could you remove and have it still be a Python? One of the pieces you have to consider is the Python standard library, the set of libraries you get when you install CPython. This is proudly declared on the Python homepage as a batteries included philosophy, the idea that Python comes with all the things you need out of the box. And while it's certainly true that the Python, the Python does come, or CPython does come with a lot of useful stuff out of the box, there's a lot of stuff it doesn't include. PyPI and PIP exist for a reason. And as people like Amber Brown have argued, many of the batteries that do come with CPython are leaking toxic chemicals. There are parts of the standard library that aren't well maintained or are prone to security problems that need to be addressed on a release schedule that isn't compatible with Python's own schedule. So how much of the standard library can you strip out and still have a Python? Is the standard library an inseparable part of Python or is it a parallel feature? Would it make any sense for there to be a minimum viable Python, a Python that is just the interpreter and the core modules like Sys that have to exist for the interpreter to work and then have everything else be an optional install from PyPI? So why am I asking all these questions? Why does it even matter if Python has a standard library or ships with a parser or a compiler or has an interactive experience? It matters because the world of computing is changing. When Python was initially developed, all computing was done on desktops and servers. Over the first 20 years of Python's life, laptops were added to the mix, but they're really just desktop machines that just don't need a power cord. And when you install Python, you installed it once on your machine and all of your projects use the same installation. Computing today is a very different experience than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. On your phone or your tablet, there are no shared resources. Every app is a standalone bundle. This means application size matters in a way that has never mattered before to the Python ecosystem. Python with a full compiler and parser and standard library is a 30 megabyte zipped installer. If you're distributing an app to a phone and you're not exposing an interactive Python prompt, why would you ship the full contents of that installer and all of the standard library? It's even more critical on the web. Nobody likes web pages that take a minute to load all their JavaScript payload before they can run. In that environment, anything you can strip from Python makes the end user experience better. It also matters because the native runtime environments aren't always going to be laptop-like. It turns out that iOS actually does present as very Unix-like under the hood. You can compile CPython for iOS with only a few patches. But Android is a Java-based system. The web runs on JavaScript. How do you run Python on those environments? Unless we are thinking about these challenges, one day we're going to discover that Python can't be used at all 
on the platforms where people are doing computing on a daily basis. This is already happening to some regard. Students are going through school using only having used an iPad. There's no Python you can get officially for, for an iPad. These conversations about what Python is, what Python looks like, what is in and what is not in a Python are all part of future-proofing Python. But who is having these conversations? So far, I've been talking about Python in purely technical terms. I've been talking about whether Python needs a compiler or a prompt or a standard library. And there's plenty of debate about the technicalities of what is or isn't a Python, plenty of reasonable arguments on both sides of all those discussions. But there is one thing that is almost unique to what makes Python Python, something that if it was removed would radically change what Python is. Python is a community, a collaborative, volunteer-driven, open-source community. This is surprisingly uncommon in programming languages. Most other programming languages that are popular today either come from a single company or have very significant backing from a small number of large companies. Java is owned by Oracle. C Sharp is owned by Microsoft. Kotlin is owned by Google. Swift is owned by Apple. If you don't work at those organizations, your ability to shape those languages is very limited. Some of the languages aren't owned by a single company. They're managed by independent standards organizations, but they started as internal company projects and still betray that history. C and C++ came from Bell Laboratories before being handed off to the ISO. JavaScript was an internal Netscape project before being handed off to ECMA. These are large bureaucratic organizations. And while it is certainly possible for a layperson to get involved, the barriers to entry are high and there are lots of commercially vested interests shaping the languages as they develop. Python, on the other hand, is entirely community driven. There is no single company that owns Python or controls the direction of Python. There are even constitutional clauses specifically designed to prevent one company from gaining that sort of control. The only popular language that I can think of that's even really comparable is Rust. And even then, Mozilla is involved in Rust in a way that no single company is involved with Python. Okay, but why does this last part matter? Why should you care if Python is a community? Well, it means that you, as a user of Python, are part of that community, and you have an almost unique opportunity to contribute to and shape that community. You may feel, living in Sri Lanka, that you are a long way from everywhere where the action is, and, you know, geographically, maybe you are. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, though, I live in Perth. Perth is often described as the most isolated capital city in the world. It is a two and a half hour flight from Perth to the nearest state capital, five hours to the nearest national capital. I was born in Perth, I went to school in Perth, and I've worked my entire career in Perth. And for seven of the last 12 years, I have worked for companies that aren't based in Perth. For the remaining five, I was running my own company. All of that is possible because of the Python community. I haven't had to leave Perth to have those opportunities. The Python community is worldwide and online. What matters? is what and how you contribute, not where you live. And it can be great for your career. Think for a moment what is involved in contributing to an open source project. If you're contributing to an open source project, you are by definition working with a large team of people spread across the globe. You'll need to communicate on a technical level to convince them about proposed designs. You'll need to review the contributions of others, mentor new developers. There's the obvious bread and butter of software engineering, designing and developing new software. You'll also need to debug problems that have been reported by others. Now, if I was to strike out the words open source from that list and replace it with literally any other software project, does this list of skills change? No. What I've described are the attributes of any well-rounded technical contributor. Involvement in open source is amazing career practice. More importantly, it's career practice that you have in the open, in places that you can point to a public record of your activities and your skills. And you don't need to be hired to gain this experience either. Open source projects are, by and large, driven by volunteers. Whoever turns up does the work. And none of it requires you to be anywhere in particular. As long as you can write email and respond on GitHub, you can participate in these communities. Okay, so you want to get involved. What should you do? Well, Python is a big community, and contributing to Python doesn't necessarily mean contributing to CPython. That is one way to contribute, but it's not the only way. There are lots of projects in the Python community. Django, Beware, Pandas, Jupyter, other Python interpreters like, uh, like uh, MicroPython and Jupyter. Contributing to any of them is a con contribution to Python as a whole. Every open source project will be a little bit different, but the broad strokes are common across almost every open source project. 
First step, you have to pick a project. My suggestion is to pick something that you think is interesting. Pick something that will carry your interest. Pick something you're already using in your day job or something you think you could use in your day job. Then find out how the community operates. Where do they track bugs? How do they manage version control? What code formatting conventions do they follow? Where do newbies go for help? Where does design discussion happen? You only get one chance to make a first impression. So there's no harm in staying quiet until you understand how things work. Look for a little bit before you jump in. Once you've got to know the landscape, your first contributions should be small. Let the project get to know you. Great place to start. Try answering questions on a mailing list or a forum or a chat room. Helping newcomers is a great way to practice your written communication skills and your empathy skills. It's also a very visible uh, contribution and a contribution that is often in very short supply. Another thing to try, triage bugs. Every project will have a bug tracker of some kind and many of the bugs that are reported won't be a complete description of the problem or they may not be a problem at all. Responding to those tickets takes time. You can be the person that provides that time or provide a code review. Look at the patches provided by other people. Do a code review to see if you can spot any problems with the code. This review process takes time. You can provide that time. Yeah, you need to be aware of how each project manages these processes. There might be conventions for how reviews are performed, but I don't know a single open source project that would turn away assistance triaging their incoming ticket queue. You can also try to fix a small bug. Try to run that bug all the way through to completion. You are probably not going to get immediate feedback on your patch. You are one of many people who is trying to contribute. And so far, you really haven't done anything to make yourself stand out from everybody else. So be patient. But if you are doing all the other steps, helping answer questions on mailing lists or triage bugs, you're going to find it a lot easier to get attention to your patches because you're not just asking for attention, you're giving back in other ways. You are being part of a community. If you do decide to write code as your first contribution, resist the temptation to start big. It is easy to fall in the trap of saying, I know, I'll write this big feature and make a name for myself. Big features are something you want to ease yourself into. If there's a big, obvious feature that is missing, clearly missing from a project, there is almost certainly history around why it hasn't been built or opinions about how it should be built. You don't want to be navigating this history as part of your first contribution to a project. Okay, so there's a couple of easy places for ideas for where you can make your first entry into a project. But whatever you do as your first contribution, there's a few things to keep in mind. Firstly, contributing to open source doesn't have to mean writing code. You'll note that of the three things that I just listed as ways to get started, only one of them involved writing new code. The most helpful, most in-demand contributions often aren't in the code at all. You can write documentation. You can help with fundraising efforts. You can write a blog or help with podcasts or write tutorials. As Sri Lankans, you are uniquely positioned in one very specific skill, Sinhala. You can translate, translate documentation, translate in-app strings. You have a language that doesn't use a Latin alphabet. You can provide excellent testing to ensure that Sinhala script and other non-Latin scripts are handled and renders correctly. And a lot of community work is extremely local. You can help organize events like PyCon Sri Lanka or local user groups. These events are organized by volunteer, or primarily by volunteers. Writing new feature code is an obvious contribution, but there is lots of work that needs to be done in any project and can be done by anybody who wants to volunteer. Secondly, keep in mind that trust is something that accumulates with time and experience. It's not enough to just do something once and expect magical results. You need to keep doing it. Reputations build over time. Any project will have an almost infinite list of things to be done. As a result, things get prioritized. There is the obvious priority of how critical is this bug or how important is this feature, but an often forgotten factor in open source contribution is how much has this person given to the community? And if you find yourself laboring away, doing unglamorous work, and you don't appear to be getting any traction, then ask. It's entirely possible that you're on someone's radar, but they're just very busy and you haven't got to the top of their to-do list yet. So ask. But a pro tip, when you do, ask directed questions. Don't ask, what could I do? Ask, would it help if I did X? Don't ask, why haven't you reviewed my patch? Ask, is there anything I can do to bump this up someone's to-do list? A large part of the success of Python is due to the fact that it is a community. And that community really does need your help. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. Python as a language needs to continue to evolve or it will become stagnant and irrelevant. We need to continue to challenge what Python is
to make sure it is the most relevant thing it can be for computing as it evolves. But it won't evolve unless people like you get involved in the discussions as they happen. Working with a worldwide community is hard work, but it can also be incredibly rewarding. I hope today I've managed to convince you to get involved to help me and the rest of the Python community shape the Python that we use in the future. We are the study. Yes, thank you so much for the insights shared, sir. It would be great to hear those insights from a pro professional like you. Uh, yeah, so next up, we have the Q&A session, and the delegates can, can clarify the doubts in the Q&A chat. Uh, we already have a few questions in the chat as well. Uh, hope I can direct them to you now. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so the first question is, why choose Python over other languages? How can Python be used with other languages to achieve scalability? Uh, okay, so there's two questions there. Why choose Python over other languages? Um, the primary reason is, if does it make you productive? Does it help you get the job done? Uh, the the running tagline of the Django project for and still is for many years was for many years still is is the uh, the the web framework for for perfectionists with deadlines. The reason Python is successful is because it gets out of your way. That's the reason to pick it. At the end of the day, engineering hours are much more expensive than CPU hours. So efficiency of the language, absolutely, it's great if a language is fast and efficient. But being able to make code happen quickly is a key reason to choose a language. And I think it's one of the reasons why Python has been so successful. How can Python be used with other languages to achieve scalability? There are any number of ways. That in itself is probably a, a, a whole conference stream unto itself. Uh, one of the interesting things about WASM as a, as a platform is it actually does make that a lot easier because uh, you now have a common point of interchange. You now have an object format, WASM, that different languages can, can communicate with. So if, you, if you're able to compile Python to WASM, it can effectively talk to any other code that is running in WASM the same way as if you're, if you're compiling with C, you can compile something in C, and compile something in C++, and compile something in Fortran. You just end up with object files that you need to link. So the short answer is, yes, scalability and interaction with, or, sorry, interaction with other languages is a key part of the scalability story. Um, WASM is an interesting piece of that puzzle going forward, but it is also not the only solution. Uh, there are other ways to bridge between languages. A lot of what Python, what, what the BWeb project is doing involves writing bridges between Objective-C and Python or between Swift and Python or between uh, Java and Python. And those bridges can be very, very viable ways of breaking out the, the pieces of code that need to run extremely quickly and don't bear well or don't um, uh, survive being written in Python well and would benefit from being a little bit more efficient. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. And we have another question like, out of Python and R, what would you recommend is the best for machine learning? Uh, hey, trying to bait me into, a, into an opinion. I, they are both completely fine. They, are, they have their own strengths and weaknesses, and it's mostly around the rest of the ecosystems around them. Uh, Python is a very, very strong language with some very, very good machine learning libraries and lots of other libraries for doing other general purpose computing things. R is a very, very good language, very, very strong language with very, very good machine learning libraries that has much better tools in the uh, numerical analysis and statistics space. It depends entirely on your problem. Who are the people you are trying to hire to work on the code? What problems are you trying to solve with the code? That is ultimately the thing that's going to be the, the, the thing that makes a recommendation one way or the other for, Py uh, for Python or R. Um, other than the obvious, well, Python, obviously, because it's great. Uh, yes, and we have a raise hand in the from the delegates. Uh, are we okay to get him on board to unmute and ask his question? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, the mic is yours, Mr. Indigo. Uh, I'm asking uh, somewhat uh, uh, related qu uh, question to the community. Uh, what feature do you think most underused and overused in Python? Uh, let me clarify why I ask this question, because 
most of the people come to Python with different programming language background, uh, such as Java or C++. But uh, after some time, I feel that most of the features are hidden in the this uh, what we call a sim simple to learn language. But there are a lot of things to learn. But most people miss those things. So what what are the features? Do you think uh, the, uh, related to my question? What uh, which are underused and uh, overused? Um, honestly, like that's a bit of a difficult question to answer. Uh, the the feature that I think is probably the the I don't know if it's even underused. It's the one that has the most potential. Is the fact that the language itself is simple and unadorned. Um, the you say that a lot of people come from other programming languages into Python. One of the biggest parts into Python is as a first programming language. And uh, like when I was taught to program, like formally taught to program 30, 30 something years ago, I was taught first in pseudocode. And Python is very close to being executable pseudocode. Like it's almost why bother teaching pseudocode, just teach Python because it is so close to the code you act, the code you run, what you read is what you get. That is a very underestimated feature of Python as a language. And it's a feature that is almost unique to Python. Um, it, almost every other programming language uses braces and you know semicolons and things like that all over the place. Not to say that that's a bad design choice to have those things. They exist for a reason. There are things that Python can't do because of its, of its choices. In terms of features that are overused, that's, I, I guess what I would say is that there are features that exist in Python that exist for largely historic and um, like compatibility reasons. Like object orientation is the only way to program in Java. It is a way to program in Python, but it's not necessarily the best way to program in Python. And a lot of people who, but let's say, but a lot of people who come to Python from a Java background or a C++ background write Python code as if it was C++ or as if it was Java. So they they write lots of classes, they write lots of getters and setters and, and things like that. And that ends up being an, a, an overused feature or overusing the basic features of the language without me, without realizing that you can actually write a lot less code and be just as functional and just as maintainable. Um, hope that answers your question. Um, yes, uh, very much. Uh... Even it is a harder question. I think you give me an excellent answer for that. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, yes, we can move on to the next question, I guess. Uh, what are the tools present to perform statics, statics analysis? Uh, that one, you're well out of my area of expertise. I am aware that static analysis tools exist, but I don't use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I am a lot more of the school of unit testing as a me mechanism. Um, I guess tools like MyPy start to fall into static analysis of a fashion. Um, but yeah, I would not profess to be an expert in static analysis on Python in, in any way. Maybe that is an untapped capability or an untapped potential. Um, static analysis of dynamic code is something that is going to be inherently difficult to do, though. So um, anyone want a PhD? There's a great place to, to dive in. Uh, yes, we have another raised hand, and I'll be handing over the mic to Mr. Rajita. Sure. Hey. Hello, yes. Yes, yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, uh, one aspect uh, uh, you talked about was the community, uh, the genuine community which uh, Python has. So in, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, we think uh, we have a long way to go. I mean, this is something that I just to Python Sri Lanka team as well. Uh, a, a, a long way to go to attract uh, the young blood into the Python community in Sri Lanka. So uh, I think once you get on rails, once you started your career, or once you've uh, taken your first step, uh, then you can move ahead. But but the but the problem is between uh, zero and one, I guess. So uh, uh, so uh, I mean, I'd like to uh, ask about your experience 
in uh, taking uh, young people from zero to one, where they are uh, getting them in, getting them on board to uh, Python. There are two ways. One uh, one way is they are maybe a uh, total newcomer to the computers. That is one way. And the other way is uh, maybe he's doing Java and something else, and we need to attract him from that. So uh, what kind of experience do you have? I mean, this would be very valuable to Sri Lankan community as well, to how to expand from uh, the, the new people, the fresh blood, how can we take in, uh, what kind of experience do you have uh, on, on that process? Uh, sure, okay. Um, there are a couple of different aspects of that. The, the first one is, is there's an Australian folk singer uh, named Paul Kelly who sang a, uh, sang a song about the Australian Aboriginal land rights movement uh, called From Little Things, Big Things Grow. Uh, it is a wonderful song and a, and a really moving story that's actually behind it about the biggest land rights claim in Australia. But the, the, the core of the song is that big things don't just happen. Big things come from very, very small things that grow and grow and grow with time. And they only happen if you keep doing them. You need to start small, do something interesting, keep doing it, iterate on it, iterate on it. If you think about the process of, like, probably, I'm, I'm guessing you've, you've almost certainly done this yourself. You hear about the existence of a meetup. You hear about it. And then the next month you hear another announcement about it. And the next month you hear another announcement about it. And eventually you say, you know what, I might actually go along to it. If that's if that meetup had only had one meeting and then never happened again, you wouldn't have known you could go along to it. You need to have repeated presentation of the idea that this is something you could do. This this meetup needs to happen every month regularly on you know the first Thursday of the month or whenever you're doing it. Whatever you're doing needs to happen and keep happening. Maintaining that momentum is the biggest thing you can do for developing a community. Just keep doing it. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to keep doing exactly the same thing. You do need to be responsive to the community and be responsive to what people are interested in or not interested in. But at the very least, whatever you do, you need to keep doing it and persist because it's the persistence that lets people know the thing is real. In terms of how do you get specifically a different, uh, different, uh, like, students in who come from no experience or students in that are coming from uh, uh, from other programming backgrounds, what I would suggest there is you need to cater your offering, cater what you are doing in your meetup or you know whatever session it is to what they are interested in to give them a compelling reason to turn up next time. Give them a reason to turn up in the first place and give them a reason why they want to be back next time. That can be something as simple as it's a really great social environment and we really make sure that everybody has a great time they first turn up and we make sure everybody has a friend when they when they arrive and everybody's got a buddy so they don't know they're not left out there alone. It can mean setting problems or setting tasks that are interesting. Like nobody actually wants to compute the Fibonacci series, but they really do want to write video games. So if you write a tutorial that is a video game, you're going to get a lot better response than if you tell them to compute the Nashi series, build developer experiences, build tutorial experiences that are compelling to the users. And the most important thing gives them a sense of accomplishment. Uh, uh, Kathy Sierra is famed for coming up with the term that the time from zero to kick ass needs to be as small as possible. You need to go from your user turns out for the front door to they feel like they are slaying giants as soon as possible. If you can get them to that quickly, then their tolerance for frustration over time will be diminished and they'll be able to achieve bigger and bigger things. So I mean, that's a couple of things about building communities. I, I won't claim that I know everything about building communities. There are many people in the Django community, like the Django girls, uh, Ola Sadako, Ola Sindeka, for example, are immeasurably better. Anything that I know about building communities is entirely a result of watching other people doing it and trying desperately to, to imitate it. So. Yes, I think we can next move on to the next question. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it is be it is better if you can mention GIL in Python. Uh, I'm not entirely certain what the question is asking. Like, so the GIL exists. Um, I my personal opinion is I don't think the GIL is as big a deal as everyone makes it out to be. There is a there is a narrow subclass of problems for which the GIL is an issue. Um, 
it is not as much as an issue in the computing that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and in the places where it is, my consistent experience has been that the engineering time spent hiring me to look at something for a month to make it faster is immeasurably more, exper more, more expensive than just buy another machine and double the number of CPU cores you throw at the problem. Um, the set of problems that are actually affected by the gill are nowhere near as large as the set of problems that people seem to claim that it does. Um, that's not to say that it isn't an issue, but I do not think it's as big a deal as many people make it out to be. Would I be happy if the gill disappeared? Yes, but mostly because people would stop talking about the gill. Uh, yes, and we can move on to the next question. Uh, will there be more focus towards web development in the future? Uh, I, uh, in what context? I guess Python as a language ecosystem as a whole has gone through a period where it was very, very web focused and cast the, cast the clock back, uh, you know, eight, eight, ten years ago, Python was a web programming language. That was why people knew about it. Over the last five five to eight years, uh, data science has become a much much bigger player in the in the ecosystem. Um, that is primarily because we lost to the ground in the browser. That if you've got to write all your client side rich rich apps in JavaScript, then you might as well write your your server side in JavaScript as well because there's going to be logic shared between the two. The advent of WASM, I think, does have the potential for a lot more a reintroduction of Python to web development because Python becomes viable for front-end development. Uh, there's an old adage that if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. JavaScript is the ultimate hammer in that sense because the only reason it is a popular programming language is because it's available in the browser. It's not because it's a good programming language. It has, over time, acquired a lot of useful characteristics of a good programming language. It is very slowly becoming, you know, all the, the rough edges are being smoothed out. It's taken a long time to get there. And if you have the option of picking a language that just doesn't have the warts to start with, why wouldn't you use it? That's it. It's not going to be easy to displace JavaScript because it is the you know, it is the, the English of the web. It is the language that is just there. So it will definitely be a challenge to do that. But I think that is a challenge that is on us to make it like the actual the fact that JavaScript is the language, like the language default of the web is a technical fact. But I think that if we can build compelling developer experiences that make that decision irrelevant, we can we would be able to see a lot more Python code being used for front-end development, which then invigorates back-end development and server-side development as well. Yes, and we can move on to the last question, I guess. Sure. Uh, does the future of Python set in stone as the go-to language for developers engaging in deep machine learning projects? I don't think that anything is set in stone. Um, anything can happen. Uh, Python was v almost very, very lucky to skate over the transition from Python 2 to Python 3. Uh, those of you who are old enough may remember Perl. Perl was the language of the early 2000s, and it took them one version going from Perl 5 to Perl 6 to become irrelevant. It's entirely possible Python could do the same thing. Someone comes up with a new, better language, works out how to transition and get a good, a good uh, 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 foothold in machine learning. It's entirely possible that Python could be uh, could be replaced. What is that language? Does it exist today? I have no idea. I do not think that it is. Uh, I, I think we we are in a very good position with machine learning. I think it is our position to lose. And part of the way we will lose it is by becoming irrelevant on the platforms where people want to use it. If you can't use a Python, a, a machine learning algorithm on your iPad, if nobody has a laptop anymore and everyone's doing their computers and computing on iPads, why are they going to use Python? Why aren't they just going to pick, uh, you know, whatever language they can, whatever whatever tomorrow's language is that does work on the iPad? Yes, and. Thank you, sir, for you sparing your time and sharing the knowledge with the community. And also thank you for the enthusiastic delegates for the continuous active participation. Yeah, that comes to the end of the successful session with you, Python enthusiasts. A big round of virtual applause to our speakers, the giants in the Python community, Matifix Sri Lanka, the 
Diamond Partner of PyCon, the organizing committee from Isaac and University of Moratua for making this event a success, and also a thank to our gold partner Iveda for joining hands with us. We are really grateful to have you on board to make PyCon Sri Lanka a success. So it brings us to the conclusion of PyCon Sri Lanka 2022, the first ever conference for Python enthusiasts. Hope you got the maximum out of the session. Thank you for your active participation. I was also privileged to moderate today's session with these great individuals. Once again, thank you to all the delegates, facilitators, and organizers. Have a great day and keep engaging with Python.